Allah is actually making a demand from the Ummah. وَأَعِدُّ لَهُمْ نَسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ This is right after Muslims won the battle of Badr. Muslims have won and the enemy has been defeated and we have collected many, many, many spoils of war. And Allah says immediately after that victory, prepare in advance for them. Meaning, you just won and Allah is saying, get ready for them. You expect Allah to say, get ready for them before the battle. But Allah is saying, get ready for them after you won. Allah is letting you know they're gonna come back. They're not done. And Allah is also letting you know just by saying, get ready for them, the preparation you made for this victory is not enough for the next battle. You need more preparation. Now how should we prepare for them? Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala, مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ Whatever you can prepare of any kind of power, we have to stop having a simple, simplistic definition of what power means. For example, nowadays for many people who don't think deeply, they think if there's an election, whoever wins the election is in power. But if you know a little bit about politics and economics and how the world actually works, these people are not in power at all. They're actually just puppets. And behind them are people that are far more powerful and the people that are actually powerful are far more invisible than the people that they put in front of you to make you think these are the people that have power. It doesn't matter if there's a very large military. The military is not what has power. Who's controlling that military? Who's deciding where that military goes? Who's deciding which way the tanks point? Where are those decisions even made? That's where power belongs. Now Allah says, build power. But then Allah added, And especially building the cavalry. The cavalry means horses ready for battle. You can imagine, is a horse cheap or expensive in the Arabian Peninsula? It's extremely expensive. If you want a cavalry, you need a couple of hundred horses. First, there's buying the horse. And if you need a horse that's going to do well in battle, you need a well-bred horse. Which means you gotta come up with money. Now I'm gonna pause that for a second and come back to us in our time. Muslims are in a crisis. This last year has been a pretty big demonstration that even though we are 20 plus percent of the world's population, all of us crying together and screaming together for genocide to stop does practically nothing. We have to look in the mirror and realize how powerless we've become. We can be as loud as we want, nobody's listening, nobody cares. And you know when people don't care? When you don't have any power. When you have power, then you say one thing and the whole world starts shaking. When you don't have power, you can scream all you want and it makes no difference. Look at us as an ummah. Aren't we always begging other people? Aren't we always standing in front of their embassies and their government officials and saying, hey, please stop, please stop, we beg you, we beg you. Please listen to us, please listen to us. Isn't that our state? And it makes young people, especially young people, very angry. And Allah gave a very powerful ayah, build power. The hijrah, Allah made Abu Bakr as-Siddiq the support for the hijrah. He invested in the horses, he invested in the travel guide, he invested in the journey. He was successful in business and he was able to use that wealth to actually support that entire journey. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stopped working. He was being a messenger of Allah full time. How do you become a messenger full time and you have no work? Where's the food gonna come from? And it's because Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha had an entire business enterprise that was supporting what Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was doing. That he was able to do what he was doing. Even behind the most noble mission that ever happened, the seal of the Prophet wasallam, behind it is business support. You know what happened nowadays? When we say Muslims have to build strong business ties. Muslims have to build strong economies. Astaghfirullah brother, the economy is dunya. We should worry about the akhirah. So when Allah said, prepare the horses and somebody's trying to make some money so they can buy a horse and somebody says, Astaghfirullah brother, why are you making money? You should slap him across the face and say, go read Quran. I don't know what religion you're following, but Allah told us to build power and you cannot build power without building what? Wealth. And if Allah has given you success in your business, you know what my advice to you is? Is that we need to build economic ties. We need to build power. Money needs to circulate within Muslim hands. You're going to get your car fixed. Get it fixed from the Muslim business down the street, the Muslim car mechanic down the street. And when he's going to buy supplies, he should buy it from the Muslim. And they should support each other. And when the Muslim businesses start succeeding and getting more successful, now they're hiring more and more Muslims. And they're developing more and more of that economy, now more people have more and more and more financial strength, the local institutions are stronger. We complain that the Israeli lobby, for example, gives millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars to politicians to get their opinion to turn this way or that way. We never asked the question, where did they get the hundreds of millions of dollars? And we never asked the question, if we had those hundreds of millions of dollars, would we give it to influence politics or would we spend it on our next vacation? We don't invest in power. We invest either in ourselves or when we feel guilty 
guilty, there's a crisis, then we pay money towards a crisis. But they, the people that understand power, you know what they invest in? They invest in the media, they invest in education, they invest in business. And when they invest in these things, then they start controlling even the politics. Whoever controls the media has a huge influence on politics. Whoever controls business has a huge influence on politics. Whoever controls education has a huge influence on politics. If the Muslims are to build power, then we have to understand what is behind that power. And we have to start building that power. And when Muslims start building this kind of power, you know what's going to happen? Allah says, تُرْهِبُونَ بِهِ عَدُوَ اللَّهِ Even as you are building this power, the enemy of Allah will be terrified. This is the only way the enemy will ever fear you. تُرْهِبُونَ بِهِ عَدُوَ اللَّهِ عَدُوَ اللَّهِ وَعَدُوَكُمْ Allah said, the one you are scaring is Allah's enemy and your enemy. Who did Allah mention first? Himself or us? He mentioned himself first. عَدُوَ Allah first. And then وَعَدُوَكُمْ Why? You have to understand that Allah is telling us to build this power not for our sake, not against our enemy. By saying Adu Allah, now I am doing this because I am supporting the mission given to me by Allah Himself. What we do in our communities, if somebody's becoming successful, everybody else starts attacking them until they fail. We see each other as competition. Until we have that mentality, we cannot build power. Maybe the most powerful thing our enemies have been able to do is not bombs. The most powerful attack of our enemy is not the media. The most powerful attack of our enemy is they keep us from being allies to each other. Because they know it. once the Muslims become allies to each other, <laughs> that's it. That's antum alone. Then you're on top. There's nothing that can stop you. And so long as we fall into this trap over and over and over again, we will keep crying and nobody will listen to our cries because we never build power. Our community should be so powerful, we don't go to the politician. The politicians come to us. May Allah make us the ummah we're supposed to be. And may Allah give victory to this ummah.